Have you ever pondered who the members of the notorious Dublin Hellfire Club were? This group included a Satanist, a double murderer and a Freemason, and has been the subject of extensive speculation and intrigue for centuries. The club, known for its alleged debauchery and occult practices, was not just a gathering of any ordinary men, but a meeting place for the most influential figures of the era. Please check out our other video on the Dublin Hellfire Club if you have not already done so. These members were individuals of high social standing, from prominent aristocrats to wealthy merchants, all unified under the veil of secrecy. But what about their backgrounds? Each member had their unique history, triumphs and tragedies. Some were born into nobility, while others clawed their way to the top echelons of society. They held key positions in politics, the military and business, influencing the course of history in their own ways. The question then arises, what became of them? Their fates varied as much as their backgrounds. Some faded into obscurity while others left lasting legacies. Some faced tragic ends, while others lived out their lives in comfort and affluence. Today, we delve into the intriguing and clandestine world of these historical figures, exploring their lives and legacies. Their stories serve as a tantalizing glimpse into a past filled with intrigue, power and scandal, reminding us that history is as fascinating as it is complex. Richard Parsons, the first Earl of Ross, was arguably the highest status of the Irish Hellfire Club members. He was born into nobility as the son of Richard Parsons, the first Viscount Ross, and Elizabeth Hamilton, the niece of the Duchess of Marlborough. In August 1717, he took his seat in the Irish House of Lords. Richard Parsons became the first Earl of Ross in 1718, but he had little interest in politics and public affairs, instead preferring amusements and society. He became the first Grand Master of the Irish Grand Lodge of Freemasons in 1725. It should be noted that the Grand Lodge in Dublin is the second oldest in the world and is considered in Freemasonry to be the second most powerful and influential lodge in the world. His character and legacy was described more than a century after his death. A nobleman could not, in so censorious a place as Dublin, lead a life of rackets, brawls and midnight confusion without being a general topic for reproach and having 50,000 faults invented to complete the number of those he had. Nay, some asserted that he dealt with the devil, established a hellfire club at the Eagle Tavern on Cork Hill, and that one, Wursdale, a mighty innocent, facetious painter, who was indeed only the agent of his gallantry, was a party concerned. Be it as it will, his lordship's character was torn to pieces everywhere, except at the groom porters, where he was a man of honor, and at the taverns, where none surpassed him in generosity. Richard Parsons was further described as having an infinite fund of wit, great spirits and liberal heart, was fond of all the vices which the beau monde call pleasures, and by those means first impaired his fortune as much as he possibly could do, and finally his health beyond repair. Parsons was known for his practical jokes that he particularly liked to inflict upon the religious. He used to reportedly receive his neighbour, the noted clergyman and moralist Dr. Madden, completely stark naked. By the age of 39, the years of excess caught up with him. It is reported that on his deathbed, he received a letter that was simply addressed to my Lord. The letter was sent by his neighbor, the Reverend Dr. Madden. It contained an account of all of Parsons' misdemeanors in his life. Whoring, gaming, drinking, rioting, turning the day into night, blaspheming his maker, and in short, all manner of wickedness. The letter urged him to repent his sins. Instead of yielding or confessing, Parsons saw a final chance for a jape. He had the letter put into fresh binding and ordered it to be immediately delivered to Robert Fitzgerald, the famously straight-laced and pious Earl of Kildare. Fitzgerald was reported to have been enraged when he received this baffling attack on his character. By the time Fitzgerald had confronted Madden and realized who had played the trick, Richard Parsons had died, enjoying one last laugh at the expense of the sombre society that he so delighted in shocking in life. Richard Parsons is also remembered for his authorship of the book Dionysus Rising, which he penned after a trip to Egypt. In this book, he claimed to have found ancient Dionysian scrolls that were stolen from the Great Library of Alexandria. These sacred texts are said to contain knowledge and rituals related to the god Dionysus, the deity of wine, fertility and ecstasy in Greek mythology. 
While the authenticity of these scrolls remains a topic of debate, Parsons' work is still considered a fascinating historical account in the study of the Dionysian cult. In 1741, Parsons passed away, leaving an indelible mark on history. His death marked the end of an era, but his legacy lived on. His titles were inherited by his son, continuing the lineage of prestige and power. However, by 1764, the earldom became extinct. It marked the end of a captivating journey that spanned generations. The legacy of Richard Parsons, the first Earl of Ross, continues to intrigue historians, providing a rich tapestry of events that shaped the course of history. It may have been a short life, but you must agree I had a whale of a time. The English painter James Worsdale appears to be the person who links the English and Irish Hellfire Clubs, and he was instrumental in the foundation of both the famous branches Irish Hellfire Clubs, firstly at Dublin, and later at Askerton in Limerick. James Worsdale is believed to be the illegitimate son of Sir Godfrey Kneller, the famous court painter of monarchs from Charles II to George I. Though other accounts state that Worsdale was only an apprentice to Kneller, but that he eloped with his niece. This latter theory is quite believable, as Worsdale appeared to relish debauchery and had a talent for attaching himself to wealthy and dissolute gentry. Worsdale apparently met some resistance when he tried and failed to seduce the famous Letitia Pilkington, the lady who was once described by Jonathan Swift, that famous Irish author of Gulliver's Travels, as the most profligate whore in either kingdom, either kingdom meaning the kingdoms of Britain and Ireland. Letitia, a poet and adventuress, once found herself under siege in her lodgings by the Earl of Ross and several persons of distinction, likely to be the Hellfire Club members. She described how the party broke into her lodgings and she was forced to lock herself in the dining room to escape. When those worthy peers could not find me, they threatened to kick the landlady. I mean to have her madam even by burglary. Being disappointed, they were forced to decamp, cursing and vowing revenge against the woman of the house. Remarkably, James Worsdale's special wine glass from the Hellfire Club's meetings in the Eagle Tavern still survives and it is housed in Philadelphia Museum of Art as part of the George H. Lorimer collection. The glass is engraved with James Worsdale, master of the Revels and the Hellfire Club, with a depiction of the members all seated with glasses, bar one who stands to give a toast, and a scalthine-filled silver punch bowl in front of them. James Worsdale left Dublin for Munster before he eventually returned to England. Worsdale died in June 1767, having outlived all but one of his fellow club members. He was buried in St Paul's Covent Garden with the following epitaph of his own composition. Eager to get, but not to keep the pelf. A friend to all mankind, except himself. One of the most intriguing figures in the Dublin Hellfire Club was Simon Luttrell, the first Earl of Carhampton. He was the son of Henry Luttrell. Henry was a noted commander of the Jacobite forces in the war against William of Orange, though he was granted a pardon after the war. However, he was said to have been accused by his erstwhile comrades in the Jacobite army of having betrayed them, and he was later murdered. After his father was killed, Simon Luttrell served as a member of parliament. He was later appointed to the rank of Baron Ernum of Luttrell's town. Legend has it that he made a pact with the devil a deal that would bring him unlimited wealth and influence. But when the devil came to claim his due, Luttrell managed to trick and distract him, escaping the deal unscathed. The details of how he managed this are not recorded. This story, whether true or not, only added to his intrigue and the mystery surrounding the Hellfire Club. Following the collapse of the Irish Hellfire Club, Simon Luttrell moved to England, where his ruthless and unscrupulous nature saw him rise to become the first Earl of Cahampton in 1784. He is believed to be the anti-hero of the anonymous poem The Diaboliad, dedicated to the worst man in England, and published in 1777. He was also described in a contemporary biography in slightly less than flattering terms. In short, he was publicly and privately insulted and despised in so much that it became a common phrase amongst most ranks of people and remains to this day that if a man was inclined to confer the greatest mark of rascality and resentment against his adversary it was enough to call him a luttrell traitor villain bastard coward and profligate and everything that can be conceived odious and horrible were received couched and understood in that one word lies damn lies i tell you 
Despite his lack of popularity, Simon Luttrell outlasted all his fellow club members and died in 1787. Like his fellow Irish Hellfire Club members, Henry Barry, Lord Santry, was a known drunkard. However, he combined his drinking and debauchery with a love for violence. Barry was reportedly prone to sudden and unpredictable acts of aggression. He is said to have had notches on his pistol barrel to represent those he had downed in duels. He was feared in Dublin for his unpredictable rage and his apparent immunity to prosecution, as he was known to routinely bribe witnesses. Two differing accounts of murders detail the aggression and cruelty of Henry Barry. The first horrifying tale describes his casual cruelty in the murder of a sedan chairman. Having forced a poor chairman that had been used to carrying him, who was lying sick abed, to drink a quart of brandy, then, with kindled spirits, he set fire to the sheets. The wretch lying all aflame soon expired in the most excruciating torture. The second murder is a matter of public record as he was arrested and brought to trial. When Henry Barry was embroiled in an incident that resulted in the fatal wounding and eventual death of Laughlin Murphy. At the inquest, the coroner's jury returned a verdict of willful murder and named court. Henry Barry as the perpetrator. The trial and scandal attracted enormous interest and the public galleries were packed with fascinated onlookers. The jury heard how, on the 9th of August, 1738, Henry Barry and a group of friends spent most of the day drinking in the kitchen of Patrick Corrigan's tavern in Palmerstown. At one stage, the victim, Laughlin Murphy, who was already acquainted with Henry Barry, passed by the kitchen door. Barry invited him to join the company. Murphy accepted. The group began to disperse as the night wore on, leaving only a Mr. Humphreys, Laughlin Murphy, and a horrendously drunk Henry Barry. Wholly intoxicated, Barry had quarreled repeatedly with Mr. Humphreys. Several times he tried to pull his sword, though he was too incapacitated to withdraw it from the scabbard. In a rage, Henry Barry stormed from the room, only to collide with Murphy. He shoved Murphy back into the kitchen and threatened to run through the next man who spoke. Murphy, with ill-judged courtesy, wished that no one might offend the noble lord. Henry Barry was true to his word and immediately plunged his sword into Murphy's side. Murphy did not die instantly. He died of infection of the wound some weeks after the initial injury. After deliberation, the jury declared a guilty verdict. Henry Barry was sentenced to be executed. Thankfully for Henry Barry, he had influential friends and relatives. Henry Barry was granted a royal pardon in June 1739. His uncle Domville paid off all Barry's enormous debts. And so Barry left Ireland to live out his days in Nottingham, where he died in 1751 at the age of 40, alone and ostracized from his friends and accomplices in Ireland. I have no regret. They deserved it. I did nothing wrong. They had it coming, I tell you. Henry Ponsonby was the younger brother of Brabazon Ponsonby, first Earl of Bessborough. He served in the Irish House of Commons as a member of Parliament for Fethard in County Tipperary. He was a colonel in the 37th Regiment of Foot and died at the Battle of Fontenoy in 1745, along with one of his fellow Hellfire Club members, Henry Clements. The Battle of Fontenoy took place on the 11th of May 1745 during the War of the Austrian Succession near Tournai, then part of the Austrian Netherlands, now in Belgium. A French army of 50,000 under Marshal Saxe defeated an army of roughly the same size, led by the Duke of Cumberland. Ours is not to question why, ours is just to do and die. The Dublin Hellfire Club was not just a gathering of influential men. It was a congregation of individuals who held sway over the fabric of society, coming from diverse walks of life and wielding both power and influence. Their combined wealth was staggering, a testament too to the influence they held in society. They were a motley crew of individuals, each with his own intriguing backstory and motivations. Their activities, both public and clandestine, were the stuff of legends and continue to stoke the fires of speculation and curiosity to this day. Their legacy provides a fascinating glimpse into a unique chapter of history. This tale of a bygone era, filled with power, wealth and intrigue, paints a vivid portrait of a time when the lines between the powerful and the ordinary were starkly drawn, providing a fascinating window into a world that, while long gone, continues to captivate the imagination. If you wish to learn more about the Irish Hellfire Club members and 18th century Ireland 
Here are some recommended web resources and books. James Kelly and Martin Powell, Clubs and Societies in 18th Century Ireland, available from Four Courts Press. Evelyn Lord, The Hellfire Clubs, Sex, Satanism and Secret Societies, available from Yale University Press. David Ryan, Blasphemers and Blackguards, The Irish Hellfire Clubs, available from Irish Academic Press. Thanks for watching our video. If you enjoyed this video, please don't forget to leave a like, comment and subscribe. Please also consider sharing the video. As a new channel, this helps us out a lot. Please also let us know your thoughts on the Dublin Hellfire Club, its members and their interesting links to Freemasonry in the comments. If you have any suggested topics for us to review, please also let us know in the comments. If you wish to support the channel on Patreon, you can do so by clicking on the link in the pinned comments and in the video description. You can avail of a seven-day free trial to check it out and gain access to exclusive content. In the meantime, God bless you, God bless your families, and bye for now.